The hypothesis that I want to explore with you today is that increasing software control of the physical world improves business outcomes for companies across a wide range of industries. By combining sensors and networks and analytic software to connect physical objects, devices, infrastructure to computing systems, companies become aware of are able to analyze and can take action on the physical world in a fundamentally different, more powerful way than they have before. And that improves their business outcomes in three different ways. It helps them optimize utilization of physical assets and financial assets, and human assets for that matter. It helps them differentiate their products and services by incorporating software control into them and it helps them change the nature of their customer engagement, transform their customer engagement in, in many instances from a one-time transaction to an ongoing relationship or engagement with customers. So those are the business goals, the outcomes or results that companies are looking for when they invest in connected world systems, when they try and connect the physical and digital world. The interesting part is when Things, previously unconnected, dumb things, get smart and get connected and start communicating with each other and with those analytic uh, sort of home base uh, systems. That, to us, where, where the, um, when objects and appliances and buildings and dirt get connected, is really when you're starting to talk about uh, a, a new uh, layer of uh, impact of information technology on the world. I mean, digital systems have done a pretty good job in industries over the years that are bit-based. The media business, the financial services business, organizing and shipping bits around, that's what IT systems do, and they've gotten pretty darn good at it over the last 50 years. Now, we're talking about IT, that digital realm, extending its tendrils out into the physical world, into transportation systems, into electric grid, water grid, buildings, factories, it's the next opportunity for growth for the ICT industry. It's a new layer of workloads, applications, things to be connected and controlled by software systems. Let me offer four drivers that we think overcome most of the challenges and accelerate adoption of connected world systems over the next several years. Um, First, price and availability of the technology components. Uh, the sensors out at the periphery, the network that connects them, and especially the analytic software back at home base, which used to be the province of highly specialized, uh, multi-million dollar computer systems, and is now available, where's your wall jack? Uh, by jacking into the cloud and uh, buying uh, on a, on a pay-per-use basis uh, the most sophisticated analytic software. Uh, around. Um, secondly, customer examples are starting to emerge in many industries that will spur either greed or fear amongst their competitors. Uh, greed, hey, we want some of that better customer engagement. We want some of that differentiated product uh, magic or fear that we're going to be left behind because our competitors are adopting those. So these uh, lighthouse customers, as they're called, uh, starting to pop up and starting to actually proliferate across a number of different industry sectors. Um, third, oops. Um, third is regulatory compliance requirements uh, in some regions, some uh, industries. Um, a uh, couple of quick examples, uh, the railroad industry in the U.S. is uh, under mandate uh, by a law actually uh, put in place in 2008 to put what's called positive train control on every freight train uh, crossing uh, the U.S. Uh, so that uh, you can intervene if a train is, is out of control, uh, is in the wrong, on the wrong track at the wrong time, the wrong speed, uh, et cetera. There can be intervention by remote control. Uh, that's a 2015 mandate for CSX and Burlington and the rest of the big uh, freight railroads uh, in the U.S. 
similar mandate uh, in the EU for what they call e-call, uh, which is a, a connected car application, an emergency call. Uh, if, the, if the airbag's deployed, if the car hits something, uh, a, a call is automatically made to a, uh, a responder uh, dispatcher. Um, so the EU has mandated that for all vehicles uh, operating within the European Union. Again, 2015, uh, that goes in place. So regulatory compliance becoming more of a uh, driver, more of a factor uh, in, in industries. I mentioned a couple of transportation examples. There are other places uh, as well. Um, and, and fourth, and maybe most, most subtly, but, but perhaps most profoundly as well, is all of our uh, individual expectations about technology are changing pretty fundamentally. Again, back to the, back to the smartphone, back to the, the retailers and, 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 and banks and, and service companies that, that all of us now carry around uh, in our pocket. We're being trained uh, by our smartphones about convenient, frequently updated, easy to use applications that help us control our assets, help us control our uh, human, physical, financial uh, assets. We're used to those applications being uh, simple to find, simple to buy, simple to use, simple to upgrade uh, or, or update. Um, those expectations about access and control spread from our individual lives as, quote, consumers, students, to into the enterprise. The consumerization phenomenon in enterprise technology, in incredibly powerful. I, I'll come back and we can do another hour on that sometime. Uh, it's an incredibly powerful phenomenon. Employees bringing their, not just their devices, but more importantly, their expectations about how technology works into an enterprise setting and demanding that they behave the way that our smartphone has trained us that technology uh, should behave. So that kind of phenomenon and the, and the rising tide of consumer expectations about ease of use, access, control, is spreading into the enterprise environment. And, and enterprise IT folks, as well as business operations, facilities, uh, logistics managers saying, hey, I need the same kind of control I have over uh, control that I have over my individual life through applications on my smartphone, why don't I have that at work? Why don't I have software control of the assets and people uh, in, a, uh, uh, in my enterprise setting? So that rising tide of expectations, we think, is another subtle but, but pretty profound driver of um, the adoption and the spread of connected world systems. The ripest connected world opportunities are in industrial sectors inventory tracking, facility management, vehicle fleet management, the really sexy stuff. Uh, thinking back to those big connected world outcomes, these opportunities really indicate that the outcome that's most in focus for companies today, and we think for the, for the near future at least, is asset optimization. How do I use these physical resources more efficiently? How do I make more of them? How do I get the trucks to go farther? How do I get my machinery to last longer? How do I get more water out of the ground per pumping minute? Um, that's where the tangible business cases, the tangible justification for implementing, for investing and in implementing these kinds of systems exists today. One example we heard about in our, in our interviews is uh, uh, wiring up uh, uh, wind farms, uh, these, these windmills. So, Something, uh, something gets out of whack, it, it phones home, it makes an, an automated uh, call to the rep, uh, to, to the uh, company. They still have to send somebody out there, but by analyzing the data stream that they're getting from that windmill, they can radically improve the odds that that, what they call a truck roll in that business, uh, you know, putting a guy in a truck and sending him out into that field to service that windmill. They can raise the odds of success that that first truck roll will in fact be the only truck roll that they need in order to, uh, to fix the problem. In this case, they are also, that, that rep uh, with, his, with his truck full of mechanical uh, gear and tool belt and all the rest, also has a tablet app that helps him or her, uh, first of all, confirm that he's at the right windmill. Before he climbs the 350 steps up to the, where the machinery is, uh, let's make sure that we're standing in front of the right one, right? 
and, and with, with GPS and the like, they can do that. But then there's also uh, a lot of content on that tablet, um, uh, video repair instructions, uh, what tools and parts do you need, and a live link back to uh, the level two expert in case things get really sticky once he's up there on the top of that, uh, on the top of that ladder. I, I mean, it couldn't be more uh, unsexy, right? But these are the kinds of applications that make the connected world go, that make the connected world really sing from a business outcome, business results kind of perspective. I wonder your quick take on, do you think that um, established industries will adopt these technologies? Or um, I, I know now a lot of like, the interesting entrepreneurs are moving towards solving bigger problems. They might they might invest in more capital intensive, um, basically startups that will right. take care of these problems. They might even displace the, right. the existing industry. Yeah. I, I mean, displacement of existing industries like energy, transportation, you know, big infrastructure-based industries, pretty hard uh, to do. But uh, the, the, the example that, that I see uh, is the so-called over-the-top phenomenon uh, in the telecommunications industry where, uh, you, you know, Skype did not go build a worldwide uh, network. Uh, they didn't launch any satellites. They didn't uh, put any fiber uh, uh, under the ocean, they didn't uh, create any manholes with uh, uh, you know fiber optic in it, right? They went over the top of the existing telecom infrastructure to provide uh, a powerful, easy to use uh, uh, service, uh, uh, cheap uh, uh, service as well. So I, I, that that to me is the analogy for what could happen in the transportation business, what could happen in the energy business. And, and, and is one of the reasons that I think the, what I call integrators and aggregators have big opportunities, because I think those are uh, places where folks who take advantage of uh, existing infrastructure, who put a front end uh, on it, the Nest thermostat, uh, a, a good example, right? Not building any power plants, uh, you, you know, not putting any gas pipelines uh, up and down the street, right? But transforming the way that a homeowner uh, interfaces with all of those systems, with the utility and, and, and their boiler in the basement, uh, et cetera. So I, I, I think that over-the-top uh, analogy from the telecoms industry applies in a lot of these other uh, infrastructure opportunities uh, as well. My question is around interoperability. Mm -hmm. um, you may touch on that here, but thinking about right. big industrial applications, and even for a car relative to a home, yeah. it seems like the the bigger the initial implementation, the less of an incentive there is to create something that can work with another provider's solutions, as opposed to intentionally blocking off those other providers. Right, right. What's your take on that? Well, yeah, okay, so, so uh, okay, now we've gotten kind of three questions on this, on, on uh, I, I mean, sort of revolving around this, so let's let's dive into this, uh, th this question. Uh, the, the incentive of a product OEM, car manufacturer being a, a, a great example, right, is, I want to create something that is proprietary, uh, that, that distinguishes, differentiates uh, the Explorer from the Yukon. Uh, and so I'm going to put smarts, uh, sensors, communications uh, capabilities, infotainment, uh, et, et cetera, uh, into that Explorer so that a consumer says, ooh, this has some bells and whistles that the Yukon does not. I'm going to buy an Explorer. And that is great as far as it goes. The problem is that once you're, once you're in that mode, and I've actually got it, I've, I've actually got it flipped, right, because it's GM that does that with, with OnStar, right? So it's actually the Yukon uh, that has that. Um, the problem is that once you do that, you're in this, you're, you're in a technology cul-de-sac. You, you, have, you have turned into the GM uh, way, right? It turns out that way doesn't go anywhere, right? It's a dead end. <laughs> Uh, you are in the GM, uh, you, you know, and, and what's GM got for you in the way of connectivity, in the way of applications, in the way of uh, uh, analysis of your capabilities, in the way of relationships with uh, your car insurance uh, provider, uh, for example? Um, the answer is they don't have much, if, if anything. They've built a, a closed uh, environment there. Hello, OnStar, right? And that's as far as you go. 
There's no API. There's no community or ecosystem of developers working on top of OnStar, right? And, and, and I, I, I'm, I'm picking on, on, uh, on GM, but extend that thinking to the Samsung dishwasher, uh, to the toaster, to the uh, HVAC system in your company's uh, basement uh, that Emerson or Schneider or, uh, um, uh, or Siemens uh, has built. Same thing. They've built a control system. Uh, we have smart building, absolutely. But guess what? That software system and control system that they built only works with their gear because it was designed to differentiate their gear in the first place, right? So it's a, it's a real paradox, and we think, I, I think, it, it works in the short run. It works if what you're after is product differentiation, but it doesn't work in the long run if what you're after is customer engagement uh, and a way of, of staying in touch and staying, uh, you know, feeding upgrades and updates and the next release to your customers, I think that's where those OEM-based solutions fall down. Hardware companies getting into software, guess what? They, they kind of suck at it, right? And I, I mean, this is a Consumer Reports thing. Uh, it says, why the My Ford touch control system stinks? Uh, you know, this is from the, the you know, non-hyperbolic uh, folks at Consumer Reports, right? But I mean, they trashed this thing. They trashed every Ford vehicle that has it. And they trashed most other vehicles. Uh, you, you know, the iDrive from, uh, from BMW, whatever uh, uh, Mercedes system is called, et cetera, they trashed them all. And they actually, Consumer Reports, that is, won't recommend vehicles that have these systems in them because they're too hard to use, they're too distracting, and they don't do what they're, what they're designed to do, which is make the car easier, more enjoyable, more efficient uh, to drive. So this gets to a, a really fundamental challenge for any company adopting connected world systems, and that is, uh, you know, if you're a metal bender, uh, you, you know, your, your, your friends uh, who bend metal to make washing machines and, and the auto companies who bend metal to make uh, vehicles, software is a whole different game. And especially software today where we're used to a little chiclet app that we buy for $1.99 and it gets updated in the background like three times a week. Um, I mean, this is a whole different game for these companies and the skill set required um, I, I, was, I was just coincidentally uh, uh, this summer in Detroit, uh, you know, in the, in the Rensen, uh, uh, talking to the, to the GM guys. Think about the recruiting challenge that an automotive company has. Think, of, think about the, the recruiting challenge that John Deere in Moline, Illinois has. Think about the recruiting challenge. You, you know, the, 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 the hotshot software engineers from, from next door here uh, are not going to New Holland, Michigan, uh, or even Detroit, Michigan, uh, to be uh, you know, software gurus for the next uh, uh, Ford uh, driving system or the next smart tractor, right? It's a, it's a huge challenge for these product OEMs to find, train, retain a fundamentally different skill set than, than their corporate DNA has, has ever uh, uh, experienced. Let's talk about interoperability in two different ways, right? One is within a class of assets, there are different, you know, if I want to control HVAC uh, within a building, there are probably three or four different manufacturers just, of, uh, just in that system alone. I have to interoperate with, with them, and they use different protocols, they have different interfaces, et cetera, right? Then I want to connect HVAC with uh, building security, with lighting, with, uh, uh, with AV, um, I, I've got another whole set of, of interfaces to deal with to, to create a multi-system. Uh, this is something we see in the, in the connected home environment. Uh, you know, HVAC, lighting, security, communications, entertainment. You know, these are, there, there are systems that could control any one of those, but what you really want to do is bring that together, right? Say, well, okay, when I pull in the driveway, garage door goes up, lights go on, temperature goes up, music starts playing, you know, whatever it is, right? You, you, you know, that, you, so what we're talking about there is a system of systems, right? So you have two, at least two layers of interoperability uh, challenge. Um, it's a long road 
to, to solving those. There's a whole alphabet soup of, of uh, uh, different technology protocols, APIs and the like being developed. But uh, I, I mean, I, I'd say we have to look a decade out to say you know, that there's a, 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 a shake out of those and there's a, a, a stead of, uh, you know, there's a, an HTTP and there's an HTML and there's a, you know, a really agreed upon uh, standards for uh, these connected world type systems. Folks, I'm just noticing we're, we're just past the top of the hour. I'm happy to stay, answer more questions, uh, et cetera. Um, so I, I don't know how, we, how you want to play it, Tim. But yeah, right, right, sorry, that was the second part of that sentence, but if you gotta go, uh, thanks for coming, and uh, it was a real pleasure. Thank you very much.